Let's do it. Hope you're enjoying your Saturday. Right now, you're listening to the best of the Chris Berg Show on the We the People Network right here on AM 1100 The Flag. Wednesday, for our Man Cave Radio, we had the former Secretary of Education with President Ronald Reagan, Mr. Bill Bennett. He's got a new book out called The Book of Man. Here is the former Secretary of Education, Mr. Bill Bennett. With me right now, our former Secretary of Education with President Ronald Reagan, Mr. Bill Bennett. He's got a new book out called The Book of Man. Readings on the Path to Manhood. I thought, what a perfect, perfect guest for us to sit down here in Man Cave Radio and visit about what's going on with men in today's society. Mr. Bennett, thank you so much for joining this morning here for Man Cave Radio. Uh, loved your piece on CNN about why men are in trouble. Let's start with the book. Uh, why write the Book of Man? Because uh, well, what is up with men? Uh, thank you, Chris. It's great to be on your show. I've heard a lot about your show, and I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for the time. Um, but what is up with men? Men are in trouble. Uh, they're falling behind. This is the first generation we know of uh, where women are graduating from college, by the way, in record numbers, uh, unlike men. And uh, as they graduate, they uh, bring to the workforce more achievement, more accomplishment, more ambition, uh, better records, and um, you know they're they are now about sixty two percent of college graduates, men about thirty eight to forty percent. So uh, that's a that's a big switch. You know, we said you go, girl, and the girls went. <laughs> uh, but it was it was some of that, but it was really more of men falling behind on a lot of fronts. Can you help explain what you think that dynamic is? I want to give out a couple things from your article that are shocking, but it's almost like men are becoming obsolete. And, I, and what I mean here is you talk about the out of wedlock birth rates. You know, women can go to a hospital now if you want her a doctor and have babies without a man, essentially. The other thing that you said that shocked me was uh, today, 18 to 34 year old men spend more time playing video games than the average 12 to 17 year old. What do you see as the fundamental dynamics taking place that's causing this to happen? Yeah. Sports writer in Philadelphia picked up on that and said, if 60 is a new 40, Maybe 25 is the new 13. So, <laughs> I don't know if that's the case. I don't, I don't mean to make light of it because it's a, a serious thing. What's the dynamic? Uh, some people would lay it all at feminism's door. I wouldn't. Uh, Gloria Steinem did famously say uh, when something like this, uh, a, a woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle. We all know about that. But, I, I, yeah, this was part of it, the empowerment of women and women stand on your own feet and, and so on. But it, it's interesting, Chris, as a result of uh, all that's happened, the feminists, uh, the women feminists, are not very happy with uh, the results that they're getting. They, they, too, would like to see more, quote, real men, um, maybe not, uh, you know, in the, uh, some of the traditional ways, which they criticize. But nobody seems to be happy about this result. I think it has to do with the loss of... Um, of, of, of memory, the loss of remembering who we are as men, what we're supposed to do as men. Uh, I go for a lot of my guidance back to the founders of this country. They were smart about a lot of things. And they said to keep this republic, we need uh, a lot of other institutions like families and churches and schools. But they said we also need virtues. And three particular virtues, I think, apply to manhood right now or should apply to manhood in greater in greater uh, quantity and uh, quality. That is the belief in work, hard work. The hard work is, uh, is important and necessary. Second, the belief in marriage uh, and family. Uh, and third, uh, the belief in uh, faith, uh, having faith, belief in God, recognizing uh, you know that you're a moral and spiritual being. I think these are things that make men truly uh, men, and if we lose sight of them, I think there's there's bound to be a lot of drift. You know, there's a fascinating book out, Bill, called uh, Midlife Crisis in the 30s, written by two women, and they talk a little bit about what you mentioned, where here's these women that have been indoctrinated by baby boomer moms going, you don't need a man, go after your career, go make it happen, and what they're finding is they're hitting in their early, mid-30s, and all of a sudden the baby clock goes off, and they're going, wait a second, I'm miserable, I want to go have babies, and I've been kind of sold a bill of goods, if you will, from my mom, because, you know, you and I both know a lot of times in those old days, you'd not have maybe have the best relationships, but yet people would stay together. So, and I see in in our media, a lot of androgyny taking place. You look at different magazines and they try to make everybody sort of look the same. Do you think that's sort of an impact or am I not seeing this correctly? 
you're on you're on top of a lot of things there. And uh, poor poor men, poor fra- men are fragile. Turns out they're more fragile in some ways. That male ego is fragile. We know a woman can fracture it with you know with a single comment. But um, it's a double whammy for these uh, gals in their thirties. Uh, first of all, they may have been lied to, and the clock is running, and they get nervous. Second, when they look around. They're they're not crazy about these androgynous men. They they this is not what they're looking for. I'll tell you the most interesting thing, Chris, in terms of the reaction of this book, it's been the reaction of women who have written me and have spoken up at lectures. I was at a prayer breakfast for Pete's sakes in Anaheim, California. Fifteen hundred people. I talked about this, and these women in their twenties and thirties stood up and went to the microphone and said, "You don't know the half of it, Mister Bennett. It's worse." <laughs> You think, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I have to lower my standards when I go out. Uh, that's a terrible thing to say. So, you know, uh, women can get the world a little clearer and not be victim uh, victims and buy into this uh, ideology, this extreme ideology. On the one hand, but on the other hand, men need to man up too. Let's talk about that. You've been around some great leaders uh, in the past. Obviously, you worked with President Ronald Reagan. You know, the one thing's There's we talk. Yes, this is a man. And I want to hit on this because one of the things we talk about a lot on this Man Cave Radio, Bill, is we say, and Bill, I can't speak for you, but I know for me, I never had somebody sit down with me and go, Chris, here's what it means to be a man. I guess I want to know how would you define that and being around some of these great leaders, what have you picked up from them and go, you know what, this this to me is the essence of manhood and what we should be striving for today. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, give me give me two minutes on it because there's a lot to say. Look, I, I didn't have a father growing up. Actually, my my mom was married and remarried five times, so there, I didn't have a consistent father in the home. But my mother went to some pains to try to get good men around my brother and me. A lot of those people turned out to be coaches. Uh, by the way, Princess, this is why it's so painful for so many of us to look at this Penn State yes. thing. You know. So horrible, but coaches and teachers, uh, and um, you know, and, and other men that she would have us meet so that we could engage in the time honored task of mimesis, the Greek word, imitation, imitation. Do what those men do. If you look at the Book of Man, uh, the book we're talking about, you'll see on a lot of the chapters and on the cover, a man is pointing into the future, and a boy is there with him. That's what a, that's what a man does. He points and says, "Be like that. Do that. Do the be like that kind of man." Uh, I remember when I was trying to draft. Colin Powell. Uh, I'm a lot more conservative than he is, but I was trying to draft him to run for president against Clinton. Uh, I said, "This one of the great things about a Powell presidency is you could say, look at that man. See that man? That's the kind of man you want to be. And I thought that could have a, a really incredible effect on particularly in the inner city community. But the answer to your question is, um, I think in the Latin word for man, there are two Latin words for man. Uh, the word genitor and the word pater. Genitor is, is father, that those are the two words for father. Uh, the word genitor means he who engages the biological act of fathering. Uh, we all know about that. We all know how to do that. Television teaches that. The movies teach that. They don't teach the other word for father, which is pater. Uh, in, uh, in, in Latin, when I studied Latin in Catholic school, we said pater noster quies in celis, our father who art in heaven. That's the guy who takes responsibility, who takes care, who makes decisions and is responsible. That is the essence of manhood. I was talking to a young woman the other day, and I'll, I'll shut up here. And I said, you're going to marry that guy? And she said, I finally decided not to. I said, why? She said, he can't make a decision. He's a 13-year-old. He goes back and forth. He can't commit. He can't make a decision. I think in some ways that's the heart of it, making important decisions about things that matter, taking responsibility for your actions. So let me ask you this. How much, you can Bill Bennett here, former Secretary of Education with President Ronald Reagan. How much are the baby boomers responsible for this? And here's what I'm getting at. There's a great book called The Fourth Turning I've read, and they talk about uh, you know, how we commonly have themes throughout human history, if you will. And my point is this. They talk about the baby boomers as coddling their kids so much because they didn't have that from their parents. And I look at this, I go, there's got to be a root to this of why these men can't make a decision. Are the baby boomers, I hate to use the word at fault, but but I mean, why is this yeah. happening that men are getting demasculinized? Yes, maybe. There's a pretty good case you could make. It's tough to fault the whole generation. You know, you can't indict a whole, whole generation. But um, that greatest generation, which raised the boomers, um, maybe forgot uh, some of the messaging that they, uh, the things that they were taught. Uh, it's a pretty selfish generation. Uh, it's used to having its own way. It's huge, first of all, so it tends to dominate. 
Uh, but maybe a lot of these messages didn't get across. I also think, Chris, it's time. It's just time. The last 20, 30 years have seen cultural shifts like we have never seen before in American life. Uh, you talk, You referenced earlier um, illegitimacy. Daniel Patrick Moynihan talked about you know, a 25% out of birth rate in 1965 for the African-American community as, uh, as being a catastrophe. 25%. Today, it's 70%. Uh, the birth rate for all babies in America, of all colors and races, is for, uh, out, of, out of wedlock is 40%. This is a huge sea change uh, in American society. And, um, you know, we have, uh, we have deconstructed, uh, as the academics would say, reality. We have said the old rules don't apply. Uh, we have challenged everything. It's a tough culture. It's a critical culture. We look at everything. We reexamine everything. But we've thrown out some of the babies with the bathwater. I want to ask you this about, you mentioned marriage as one of the three tenets, work, marriage, and faith. Again, Bill Bennett here on the Chris Berg Show. It's Man Cave Radio. Um, there's some great information. You talk about this out of wedlock piece. The Heritage Foundation's got a great study about, hey, you yep. want to get rid of poverty? Stay married. Yep. Get married and stay married. married. And I want to have you also share in the context of, you know, again, the media, Friends with Benefits, that movie that came out a while back, but basically saying, you don't need to get married, even be boyfriend and girlfriend, just go out there and hang out with people. And now we've got four out of 10 Americans saying that marriage is obsolete. I mean, how do we get this back on track? Because I had a great phone call that came in, Bill, one time, and he said, Chris, as the family goes, so goes the nation. I thought, boy, that is spot on. No, it is the little platoon. It's the little platoon which carries a lot on its back. I used to say after being sec of ed, Secretary of Education and then drugs are give me better churches, better families, better schools, and I'll give you back eighty five percent of the pathology wow. of American life. And it's true. And and the family's the single most important part of that. But the single most important thing a guy does in the family as a husband and father is to make a commitment, make a promise. Uh, I'm a, a huge sports fan and I you know, I follow all the sports uh but you know we got we can't we, we got to look at it unblinkingly. And when you look at the NBA and you look at some of these other you know sports, you see the number of you know fathered out of wedlock fathered children by some of our you know a lot of our players. It's a disgrace. Uh, and these are often held up as the kind of guys kids kids want to be. So we all know what it means to be a man in some deep sense. We all know it's putting away the things of childhood, whether it's video games or at least, you know, for three hours a day. That, that number you cited, Chris, 18 to 35, uh, on average, uh, I, I'm sure you saw that statistic, guys 18 to 35 play two and a half hours a day. I don't know where the heck they do it. They're not doing three hours a day. I'll tell you that. But, but uh, it's, a, it's amazing. So we all know what this is about. And, um, you know, it's, it's a matter of, of adjusting to reality if we want the results that uh, that will keep this country going. I think your caller was right. One, one of the things <laughs> I want to visit with you about, sir, is, and I don't know how long you've been married, but you mentioned Ronald and Nancy. I had a chance to go to uh, president. You've been married 30 years. Yeah. Congratulations. You said you had you know didn't have a steady dad. So you didn't have a great model. I was fortunate enough. A friend of mine took me out to uh, President Reagan's ranch out there in Santa Barbara, and, and you would hear stories about him and Nancy. And I think, didn't he build that lake or the the deck for Nancy at one point. I guess my, my real question for, for you is, is being around Ronald and Nancy, having your own marriage for 30 years, talk to us younger men about, hey, Chris, this is the key to having a great, happy marriage. Well, I think that relationship, keeping a priority in that relationship was uh, uh, was very, very important. Uh, me, uh, Ronald Reagan as a father, I think, is a different story than Ronald Reagan as a husband, to be perfectly honest. I think Mike uh, Michael would tell you he's a great father, um, but it was it was much more complicated. You know, it was a mixed family, and there were there, you'd get different accounts there. But the relationship between him and Nancy was uh, a special, impenetrable. You know, only the two of them, uh, you know, understood what went on between them, and she was his constant protector. But they nurtured it. They took time for it, Chris. Like I said, they had dates on weekends. You know, they just went off the two of them, and of course the Secret Service. But nobody else. I mean, a lot of other presidents make this, you know, big social stuff and a lot of golf and a lot of other people hanging around. They took it as uh, as Ron and Nancy time, and you got to nurture that relationship. We have dates. We still have dates, and um, we think that uh, that's very important. You know, when you're calling each other mom and dad because of the kids, you know, it's time for a date. <laughs> I haven't gotten to that point yet, but thanks for the tip. That was good. You know what I mean? You know what I mean. Because <laughs> you know you start do. referring to them, each other as mom and dad for the benefit of the kids. Now, mom wants you to do this, 
hey, start start calling me, you know, that, that cool girl you dated 30 years ago, you know. <laughs> Uh, one one more quick question. I want to be respectful for your time, but I really appreciate you taking this, this much time with us. You Thank said you're you. a huge sports fan. I'm a huge sports buff as well. Uh, earlier in the week, we had Joe Ehrman on. I don't know if you remember that name. He played with the Indians sure with the Baltimore Colts, and he's got a great program now where he's working with uh, young men and helping them become great men. And he says, look, Chris, uh, there's three false pretenses for men in society. One is athletic prowess, sexual prowess, and economic prowess. He goes, what I think makes a great man is integrity and compassion. My point is, is I, I want to get your take on this Penn State situation because what he said, he goes, Chris, it just shows you what's missing in our fabric of society today amongst men is that men didn't step up and do the right thing and call other men out. It was like, hey, man, if you don't call me out, I won't call you out. We're all good here. I want to get your comments on this Penn State scenario. I guess it's the worst scandal in college sports history, isn't it, Chris? Can you think of oh. another one? I've been racking my brain. I'm, I'm writing a piece for CNN right now. I don't think there's a worse one. And I, I guess, I, you know, here you go. SMU, you remember, got the death penalty for some of those deals, you know, that financial stuff under the table. Do you remember that? Absolutely. Uh, the, you know, if, that's the, if that merited the death penalty, this, this merits eternal damnation. I mean, I, I, I don't mean to sound ridiculous here, but this is, is fundamentally at odds with everything we're doing in a teaching and educational institution, character-forming institution. Uh, I watched Joe Irma across the sidelines. My kids played for a high school. It was a rival of the high school where his kids went and he, where he coached. Wow. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, I went up and shook his hand there after a game because I very much admire his work. But, uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm afraid this was a horrible thing. We got, we got more of the story is coming out. You know, people jumped all over McQuarrie. I don't know. McQuarrie, uh, the assistant coach, is now saying, nope, I stopped it. I stopped what, what I saw. We, we just need to find out more. But right now, it is uh, it is ugly, and um, people need to step back a little bit and not just say, man, I would have gone in there and busted it up and broken heads. That's fine. But we need to reflect about why it was so quiet and how this thing could have been concealed and lived with for so long. Um, that, that's right. It was a big lie, and people were living in it. And, uh, again, what did I say earlier? Take responsibility. Take accountability. Uh, take responsibility for your actions. That's manhood. And even if it's going to, you know, dampen again, it's clear they were trying to save uh, Joe Pa's legacy and the institution sure. of Penn State. And uh, again, Bill Bennett here, former Secretary of Education with President Ronald Reagan, great radio show host. Just for some levity, Bill, here to as we wrap things up, have you ever seen a guy play quarterback like Aaron Rodgers is today? It's incredible. No, I have never. <laughs> Do you know who Paul Ryan is? Oh yeah, Chairman of the Budget Committee. Yeah. He, he used to work for me, right? He's from Wisconsin. He's tall. He's lean. He does the PX90 workout every day. <laughs> I, intro, I introduced You know what's coming. I introduced him the other day, and I said, here he is, the pride of Wisconsin. He's tall. He's lean. He's tough. They love him. He worked for a great mentor. Now he's out there on his own. Ryan gets up out of the chair. I said, sit down. I'm talking about Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is so, so true. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Pride of the Midwest. We love you think them. they win another championship? Yeah, who's stopping it? Who can stop uh, it? San Francisco? You know, how about Jim Harbaugh? I, I played football out at Stanford, uh, obviously, a while ago. But to see Harbaugh do really? his thing, yeah, it was uh, with Dennis Green recruited me, and then Bill Walsh came in. But uh, sometime, Bill, I'll share with you some, some great football stories. I took over Kurt Warner's job at University of Northern Iowa, and we'll – you know, keep that another time. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, to see Jim Harbaugh go and take the 49ers to 8-1 and one is just, it's incredible. Were you, how, do you know the mayor of Newark, New Jersey? I didn't play with him, but I, I do know him. Corey's uh, an interesting For, cat. Corey Booker. Yes. Yeah, interesting cat. You, are you suffering from this loss last week? I am. I, I was yeah. I was ready to go. David Shaw, I played with David Shaw, and I thought, oh, he's going to pick up a win here and uh, yeah. just couldn't quite pull it off. But, you know, well, I would have been rebuked boy, Stanford, LSU. Talk about different programs, huh? Yeah. And, and you know, <laughs> speaking of Cory Booker, he was on an interesting panel recently, and I just want to get some quick comments on you this, uh, about education. Don't even know who we're talking about. We're having a private conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Cory Booker, by the way, yeah, mayor of Newark, New Jersey, went to Stanford, played football there, and uh, he was on a panel recently with the president of Stanford. It was Cory uh, the gentleman who started uh, Khan Academy, he's from Stanford as well. And anyways, right, they, were, they right. were talking about education in America, and there was a great piece that, I'm not a big fan of this guy, but Fareed Zakaria did as well. And he said, look, we spend more money than any country on the planet on our students, and yet we're, I think, 16th in reading, 25th in math, and 31st in science. Correct. Being the Correct. former Secretary of Education, what would you do to turn this thing back around? 
well, I'll say the same word I said in our, throughout our discussion, accountability. You don't have accountability in, um, in, uh, in American education. If you don't get audiences, if you don't get audience, Chris, if you don't get people going to the stores uh, that, you're, that you're recommending, uh, the, the folks who are your sponsors, you know, you lose your show. You're, you're not on the mm-hmm. air. Uh, in American education, you're a great teacher. Nothing happens. You're a poor teacher. Nothing happens. It's not the way it should be. Outside of the parent, the teacher is the single most important adult in a child's life, and we do not reward our teachers. Our kids are entering are great teachers. Our kids are entering a competitive marketplace. They're competing with everybody else in the world for these jobs, but our teachers aren't competing with anybody because there's no accountability in the profession. Bill Bennett. We have great teachers. We have some great teachers, and we have some teachers who should be doing something else. But uh, we uh, we need to make the system accountable for quality and excellence. No, Bill, I want to respect your time and say thank you again so much for spending the amount of time you have with us today. Bill Bennett, the book is... The Book of Man, Readings on the Path to Manhood. Please do yourself a favor and check it out. Bill, I've got emails coming in, people on my Facebook page. Uh, Tell Bill we love him, we miss him, and uh, we appreciate all your hard work. So thank you very much, sir. They don't have to miss me. They can tune me in 6 a.m. Eastern. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) We we will hopefully we'll talk to you again soon, sir. Okay, have a great day. again. Thank you to Mr. Bill Bennett for spending some time with me here on the Chris Berg Show got to tell you, after the interview, I felt like calling him Grandpa Bill. I mean, what a wonderful, wonderful man. Thanks for the uh, the time you spent with us, and what a great interview. Right now, you're listening to the best of the Chris Berg Show on the We The People Network right here on AM 1100 The Flag, Wednesday show. Be sure and tune in. As you know, November 23rd is the date they're supposed to have this whole super committee worked out. The Farm Bill, a huge, huge part of the super committee, joining me, Chris Berg, on the show Wednesday for our all-access ag segment. I've got Representative Colin Peterson, big part of the House Ag Committee. He'll give us the inside scoop on what's the latest with the 2012 Farm Bill and the Super Committee right here on the Chris Berg Show. And right now you're listening to the best of the Chris Berg Show on the We the People Network right here on AM 1100 The Flag.